on October 15, 1969, in Washington and cities across America, hundreds of thousands of protesters participated in a nationwide moratorium against the Vietnam War. The anti-war movement had gained momentum during Nixon's first year as president, and these protests were seen as a direct challenge to his policy and his presidency. Another big nationwide protest was planned for November 15th. Top White House aides Bob Haldeman and John Ehrlichman checked out the demonstrators and the buses that were used as barriers to protect the White House on a helicopter ride above the city. Haldeman's shaky Super 8 camera recorded what they saw. The president was scheduled to deliver a speech on November 3rd, and there was widespread speculation about what he would say. The conventional wisdom was that the protests would force him to bring all the American troops home from Vietnam. Some on the White House staff were invited to contribute ideas for the speech. I'm Dwight Chapin. I was a 29-year-old White House aide, and I wrote a memorandum suggesting rallying support from middle-class Americans. The president wrote his speech himself at the White House and at Camp David. He spent hours and days making notes and outlines and drafts on yellow legal pads. In his handwritten diary for November 1st, White House Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman noted, P at Camp David, he called in the afternoon, very relaxed, said, well, the baby's been born, worked until four this morning, have final draft. Two nights later, 70 million Americans, the largest audience for any presidential address to that time, were watching to see what the president would say about Vietnam. Now let me begin by describing the situation I found when I was inaugurated on January 20. The war had been going on for four years. 31,000 Americans had been killed in action. The training program for the South Vietnamese was beyond schedule. 540,000 Americans were in Vietnam with no plans to reduce the number. No progress had been made at the negotiations in Paris, and the United States had not put forth a comprehensive peace proposal. The war was causing deep division at home and criticism from many of our friends as well as our enemies abroad. He described the situation he had inherited when he became president 10 months earlier. He outlined his many public and private initiatives to end the war, including a personal letter to North Vietnamese leader Ho Chi Minh, and he reported how every attempt had been ignored or rebuffed. He said he respected and shared the hunger for peace of the young protesters and his critics, but he would not allow American policy to be made in the streets. In San Francisco, a few weeks ago, I saw demonstrators carrying signs reading, Lose in Vietnam. Bring the boys home. Well, one of the strengths of our free society is that any American has a right to reach that conclusion and to advocate that point of view. But as President of the United States, I would be untrue to my oath of office if I allowed the policy of this nation to be dictated by the minority who hold that point of view and who try to impose it on the nation by mounting demonstrations the street. He announced his policy of Vietnamization, stepping up the training of South Vietnam's armed forces to take over the fight for their nation. In the previous administration, we Americanized the war in Vietnam. In this administration, we are Vietnamizing the search for peace. After presenting the facts, the president described the two options he had and the choice he had made. I can order an immediate precipitate withdrawal of all Americans from Vietnam without regard to the effects of that action. Or we can persist in our search for a just peace through a negotiated settlement if possible, or through continued implementation of our plan for Vietnamization if necessary. A plan in which we will withdraw all of our forces from Vietnam on a schedule in accordance with our program as the South Vietnamese become strong enough to defend their own freedom. I have chosen 
this second course. It is not the easy way. It is the right way. Concluding his speech, he spoke to the Americans who wanted to end the war, but who weren't protesting for immediate withdrawal. He identified them as the silent majority. So tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. I pledged in my campaign for the presidency to end the war in a way that we could win the peace. I have initiated a plan of action which will enable me to keep that pledge. The more support I can have from the American people, the sooner that pledge can be redeemed. For the more divided we are at home, the less likely the enemy is to negotiate at Paris. Let us be united for peace. Let us also be united against defeat. Because let us understand, North Vietnam cannot defeat or humiliate the United States. Only Americans can do that. Public response was immediate. The White House switchboard and congressional offices were flooded with calls. Support immediately soared to 68%, when Gallup poll recorded 77% in favor. Chief of Staff Haldeman called me around midnight and said no telegrams were arriving. The White House Western Union office had closed at the usual time. So I asked the White House switchboard to get the president of Western Union on the phone. I woke him up by saying that their White House office had to be opened immediately. The next morning, all the overnight wires were piled on the president's Oval Office desk. Photographs of the desk were seen across America and around the world. Today, the silent majority speech is considered a model of presidential oratory and is included in histories and anthologies. In his diary, Haldeman wrote, P especially pleased at the reaction from the speech because he succeeded in moving people to action without demagoguing. His view is that you fire people up with a tough, loud speech, but you win them over and change their minds only by calm reasoning. And that's a behind the scenes account of the silent majority speech delivered 50 years ago on November 3rd, 1969.